<laughs> I'll be quiet now. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the next episode of the AV Club. We have appeared suddenly from Steaming and Broods. Um, this is indeed the Undimension and Player Guard review. I am Ian, and I have Sean with me here. I Hi, am Sean. here. Don't mind that garage door opening beneath me, as is, <laughs> as is custom whenever we record. I think that's an Easter egg for our incorporated in the drinking game <laughs> unfortunately uh we do not have uh scott or nick or tom here it's just us um the rest of the mythos busters broods have been set aside out of play and i don't think it'll be coming into play anytime soon yeah, so like the sean and ian spinoff series we, <laughs> we really get to develop our characters on an individual level now yeah that's true it's uh finally the buddy cop movie and ask for <laughs> <laughs> so we will start off uh speaking with speaking of references to movies with a guardian event do you want to read the first one john sure uh let me sorry so doing the player card reviews for the undimensioned and unseen of course we've got uh <laughs> if it bleeds which is a level zero one cost guardian event. It has a will, power, and combat icon. Fast after you, or sorry, fast play after you defeat a monster enemy. Each investigator at your location heals horror equal to that enemy's horror value. It's a small comfort, but you'll take it. And this has <laughs> some of the most intense art I feel in the game. It's some mass of tentacles and jaws and eyeballs that's just been smashed into a pulp and (laughs) left for dead by a a fire axe. Pile of gore. Yep. So wouldn't uh, be too far out of wouldn't be too far out of place in a death metal album cover, I think. No, and I also love the fact that this is a predator reference, right? That's that's a Jesse Ventura line. (laughs) The good old body governor. I think we need a few more of uh, quality Jesse Ventura Predator li- uh, quoted cards in the game. <laughs> Dug in deeper than a Louisiana blood tick or whatever <laughs> he says is a seeker card. <laughs> I ain't got time to bleed is basically I've had worse though, right? Yeah, it, that is probably one of the movie lines I quote the most in my everyday life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so anyway, if it bleeds, I like this card. Um, I think before this came out, Guardians did not have a whole lot by way of dealing with horror outside of just trying to play down assets that uh, that had sanity on them. Mm-hmm. You're going to be defeating monsters anyway, ideally. And uh, this also scales for multiplayer if you happen to have some friends in the room. So I'm generally pretty pretty positive on this one for a starter deck. I will say it probably gets cut for for other cards down the campaign. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with it, that I like it, uh, but I find when I initially have it, it eventually ends up getting cut, either on kind of the initial cutting room floor when you're trying to get down to 30 or grade. I think a couple things are going on. One is I'm stuck in the uh, Lord of the Rings mentality where cards that refer to specific traits of enemies often are just bad because they're the traits are so wildly I mean, varying in that game right um whereas in this game there's a lot of monsters so this is scenario dependent because there are certain scenarios where you're just getting mostly kind of the regular humanoid enemies but i feel like most scenarios include at least some monsters and are. i i want to point out as kind of a sub point to that Um, You might look at this and go, well, not every enemy is going to have horror value, right? But I venture Mm -hmm. that I think most monsters in the game have at least one horror. Yeah, I think it's mostly the humans don't have horror, which makes sense, you know, that it's going to be the horrific monsters that give you horror. Um, Now, in most cases, it's probably going to be modest. Like, there's not a ton of enemies out there that get more than two unless they're a big boss so you're probably looking at one in most cases maybe two um i feel like this is 
or so a good three or four player grab because it has that clause that it heals each investigator at your location. So solo, eh, may, there's probably a, other better ways, probably just including more horror soaks, like allies and uh, items or whatever that soak the, the horror is probably a better bet. But uh, in three or four player, I think this is worth looking at. Agree. The next card is uh, an interesting one. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> um, this is a forecast level four Springfield M uh, M nineteen o three has the I'm not guy, so I don't know if it's supposed to be one nine o three or nineteen o three. Don't write me any letters. Um, combat and agility icons, item, weapon, and firearm traded uses three ammo. Action, spend one ammo to fight. You get plus three combat and deal plus two damage for this attack. Okay, that sounds good. But cannot be used to attack enemies engaged with you. And it takes up two hand slots. Oof. Because you're... Yeah. Oof. I feel like this reading this card is like a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Going up and then... Probably you look at those top two... Those last two parts with the uh the cannot attack enemies engage with the double hands yeah yeah i feel like this this card just got balanced like one and a half steps too far mm, yes because because if we start you know with the 45 being the baseline plus one to the test it's a plus one to the damage you know every weapon that kind of iterates kind of has to move somewhere from that center point they mm -hmm. gotta make it a little interesting. So it's you know it's a really accurate weapon, so you get plus three to the fight, you get plus two damage. The fact that the enemy cannot be engaged with you, that's ultimately what makes this card really dicey for me. Because yes. A straight up useless in solo. I'll just go ahead and say that. Even if you have an investigator yeah. that could presumably evade the enemy first <laughs> in order to fight it, dear god, why would you want to do that? Yeah. And in multiplayer, you're counting on your your teammates pulling the enemies, which, you know, happens, but I think if you're if you're building an investigator, you're spending four experience on a weapon, you want to kill enemies, and if you want to kill enemies, you're just generally going to try to fight them with yourself too, right? Like, ah. Uh, ah. Uh, yeah. It's rough. This is a uh card that's looking for an investigator three guarding that we have now and they're the ones who can take this because of or um they none of them are very so they're not going to be like a shooting um and all of them pretty much even in multiplayer especially in multiplayer they like to just grab the enemies and get up close with them and fight them they don't want other investigators to be taking them on and then they snipe this i mean maybe you have some kind of experimental like four player build where you have like two guardian investigators and one's the tank and this is like the ranger equivalent <laughs> with range weapons but uh i think that's going too far into uh experimental theoretical zone at that point you have to work too hard to make this thing work is, yeah. is ultimately what it is and it takes up two hand slots so you can't even be like okay this is my utility weapon and i'm carrying my machete yeah. in my other hand <clears throat> that's the killer the two hand slots um because yeah because you could ha technically have your regular weapon to kill enemies engage with you in this thing but I mean, you could take Bandolier, which gives you an extra hand slot. But again, that's, again, is just too much effort to make this thing work. When you could spend that 4 XP on a shotgun or one more XP for a lightning gun and just be more, way more versatile. You know what would make this somewhat... Uh, let's play Redesign the Card for a quick second. <laughs> Cannot be used to attack enemies engaged with you. May be used to attack non-elite, aloof enemies. Would that mm. that would that be a thing? I know it makes it slightly more playable. Would it put it in the realm of playable playable? Be able to sniper whipper will out of a tree. <laughs> Granted, if you <laughs> if you're spending one of your precious three ammo on a whipper will, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> would be yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think of what 
could have made this maybe one fewer XP. Maybe, I don't know. It's just hard because there's all the other upgraded weapons are just better. I don't know. Maybe if it would have given you differential, like you get a boost if you attack enemies engage with you, but then a better boost if they're not. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. I don't know. It's don't a pass know. in pretty much every build I can think of. I I would tend to agree. Yeah. Let's stop spending so much time talking about bad cards and move on to an amazing <laughs> card, right? Yes. Definitely. I think this is yours. Oh, it is. Okay, so we move on to the level zero seeker skill, Inquiring Mind. It has three wild icons. It's innate and commit to a skill test only if there is a clue at your location. So we talked about on the last episode how three wild icons on Rise to the Occasion was really not that great with how limited it was. Here we go, we have another three wild icon test with a limiter. And I think this one's pretty amazing. Yeah. I think it's just... It's much better than Rise to the Occasion. It's... They're definitely going to be locations out there with clues on them. That's just kind of a thing. That depends on (laughs) where you're at in the game and the scenario. Uh... But there's also some tools, and I'm peeking into the future again. I know that's bad, but there's an ally in an upcoming pack, Malison, who has an ability that lets you actually put one of your clues on a location. So that's potentially a way to help set this up. And uh, because it doesn't have that below two or below clause that Rise to the Occasion has, it this is much more versatile that you can use it on any one of your skills that you need. And it can be committed to someone else. Mm-hmm. Whereas Rise to the Occasion is only your skill test, which limit, li- limits it even further. Um, yeah, I'm generally positive on Inquiring Mind. I don't think it goes in every deck, but it goes in a no. lot of decks. Yeah, yeah. I, I like it a lot for Roland because he does a lot of uh, playing around with clues being on the location. And uh, it just makes sense with him because a lot of times you're grabbing that clue by killing an enemy. So there, clue there, you have an enemy, you commit this to make sure you kill it, and then you get the clue. Yep. Good card. Or or someone like Rex, you know, who wants to go over by two. Wanting to kill again, that's perfect. It's, yeah. Or peeking into the future again with Min, this is a four wild icon card when <laughs> Min chucks it, so can't go wrong there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so the next one, um, if there's a weakness in this pack, this might mm-hmm. be one of the contenders. Oh, damn, you saw <laughs> it. It's exposed. <laughs> uh, this is a zero-cost event. Uh, level one has an intellect and two combat icons. Exposed weakness has the insight trait. Fast play during any uh, free player window. Choose an enemy at your location. Test Intellect X, where X is that enemy's fight value. For each point you succeed by, reduce that enemy's fight value by one for the next attack performed against it this phase. <clears throat> and we have a crazy lobster creature, crab creature from Moana on <laughs> <laughs> I'm so shiny! <laughs> there it is. So... Yeah, this is this yeah. is another card that I feel like just got limited one step too far. So okay, so you so you include this in your deck for an investigator who needs help fighting, right? Because the ultimate result of this is you reduce an enemy's fight value, making it fight them. Mm-hmm. It's trying to leverage intellect for fighting, which, which is a lot cool. of seeker cards like to do. Mm-hmm. Um. But the problem is almost every card that does that in Seeker is better than this. <laughs> like uh, Mind Over Matter, uh, your I've Got a Plan, where you just straight up deal damage to it using your intellect. Uh, 
what else um some future cards that i won't necessarily bring up but yeah there's there's just a lot of options for that and exposed weakness ends up being the weak link in those in those cards i i love the theme of it like using your intellect yes. figuring out where the weak spot is like in this crab creature art there's some kind of shiny patch like in smaug or something like the weak spot in its armor the thrush but told practice, us about it I think what really kills it too is that it's just for the next attack. If it was until the end of the phase for everyone, like that could be pretty bomb. There it is. That's how I'd fix this card. Like, yeah. it's a really cool effect and it feels so seekery, right? And it feels like a really yeah. cool moment. You know, seekers would be able to contribute to combat without actually swinging a you know, baseball bat around, which feels kind of seekery. I feel like. <laughs> I feel like level two is going to be this exact same card, except you reduce it till the end of the phase. Boom. Yeah, Cards play. Yeah. In most cases, like, I think the common critique of this card, which is right on, is it's a card where most of the time you'd probably be better off just committing the two combat icons. Yep. <laughs> it's only one and, test. It's so crazy that it's only one test. Yeah. It's probably the only mainly viable situation for this is in multiplayer and you're trying to shot play or something so you really want to get that enemy's fight value down so that uh that shotgun player can do the thing but again in most cases you're probably just better off doing the sure thing and committing the combat icons yeah it's just I mean, it's just hard to justify this card it is so let's stop trying Okay, <laughs> fine with that. <laughs> that, that card could be very easily card. fixed. <laughs> yeah. So the next card is... <clears throat> oh, I suppose I did the opposite thing of this card and not practice quick... Th oh, okay, I'm just going to stop. Um, <laughs> so quick thinking. It's a level zero rogue skill. It has one wild icon. It is innate traded. And if this skill test is successful by two or more, after it resolves, you may immediately take an action as if it were your turn. This action does not count toward the number of actions you take each. Um, so, of all of the many resources that Arkham Horror, the card game, makes you manage, I think it's safe to say that none of them is more precious or valuable than an action. Mm -hmm. Fair? For sure. For sure. And Rogue has a fair few tools at its disposal. Hedge your bets to make sure you succeed by two or more. It's got some skills. It's got Streetwise to pump up by a decent amount. It's got uh, a later card we'll see that actually just says, you now succeed this test by two or more, which is pretty cool. And as like a free action is so good. We pay six. Yeah. For an ally that gives you a free action. Now every turn, but still, <laughs> six is a lot of resources for that, and people love Leo the Manatee. <clears throat> so, I don't know, I'm yeah. very positive on quick thinking. I think it's at least a one of, and just about any investigator who can take it, and pretty decent argument. Yeah, I, I use it a ton in all of my builds, for sure. I'm usually, usually rolling with two, um, one at minimum. Because, yeah, it is so important. I think, again, to... to to make that dead horse even more dead and beat it some more. <laughs> <laughs> um, the issue with some of the action economy argument, it's not just like there's a, a sea of actions as far as the eye can see. It's not a free currency. All equally. Yeah, it's, it's, you're restricted within this three action framework. And a lot of times that matters because a lot of times you run up against only Please having reading. three actions and you find Human yourself needing just one more. You know, you evade an enemy and you need to investigate or get away or whatever the case may be. And you find yourself out of actions and like, okay, I'm screwed. And something like quick thinking, I've used it a lot to say um, because uh, rogues are stronger than agility. You commit this to that. They succeed on the agility test. Why is love? Uh, this goes off and gives you another action in it, or like I said, investigate or get away. Um, and it also has some interesting uses that you can use it against the treachery, maybe get an action phase actually. 
or um, use it, uh, commit it to another um, investigator's action as well. So there's some weird flexible use cases you have there. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a good card. I or can be said aside from very thorough yeah. analysis. <laughs> which all of which I agree with. And I also have to point out, Ian, you probably couldn't have couldn't hear it, but uh we're having those fun moments where <laughs> Tom's Mass Effect sound effects are, are coming back into the stream randomly for no reason at all. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who are hearing those, we apologize. We're still not sure what triggers those. I don't think Tom is streaming right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the tricks I like with quick thinking is just uh, low difficulty stuff. That sounds obvious, but don't use it against the harder test because it's not going to go off. So use it against your rats. Use it against that one shroud location. It'll take your free action and run. Like, I mean, I've done this in in Jenny before. Where no, no, wait, that that was that. never mind. Um, yeah, good card. Good. Uh, well, I feel very fortunate be able to read this card because i love it this is the two cost rogue asset lucky dice or are they <laughs> level two has the uh, will and agility icon item and relic traded exceptional um so for those of you following along at home that means it actually costs double the experience and you can only have one deck reaction after you reveal a case you can spend two resources Ignore that chaos token and reveal another one to resolve. If that token has a tentacle symbol, remove lucky dice from the game. Now, I have to double check because I don't remember if it's actually the correct errata text or not. Oh, I, yeah. I didn't think about that. This is one of the there, first cards we I, had in the game that got errata. Um, yeah. Go ahead and just talk uh, about lucky dice on a, on a general... general <laughs> uh, scope, and I'll, I'll go ahead and grab the regular time okay um so lucky dice it's kind of like a rogue version of the windy ability in a way in the sense that it's giving you another shot at the chaos bag uh we all know how fickle the chaos bag is and how often it can uh screw you exactly when you need to succeed at something and so lucky dice more than anything to me is kind of an insurance policy uh in that way all right cool i have found the upgraded text it's really more of a clarification than anything it just changes how it interacts with the auto fail token um here ian i'll post it in our live chat okay um so the eroded text of lucky dice and yeah i think you're right sean that the issue was just that it it um, let you cancel the the printed version let you re-reveal the um the tentacle the tentacle would still right. remove it from the game uh if you drew so it the, again but so the new version is when you reveal a tentacle token um, so that's that key clause that if you reveal a tentacle at first, then you're not able to trigger spending two resources and revealing a new one. Um, but the same thing, if you reveal the tentacle, then it's going to remove it from the game. Yeah. So just, just cementing <clears throat> kind of the design philosophy that nothing escapes the... Except for Wendy. Wendy Except escapes for the fail token. So Wendy is still uh, tops in that regard. And, but, uh, and Wendy still, can take it, this card, it turns out. <laughs> yeah, she can. She's just you wanna... the chance mitigation machine. <laughs> Master of the chaos bag. Um, I don't think, and I was having this conversation on Disney, I don't think this is in, as much as I love it, I don't think it's in every rogue or everyone who can take it by. I think there are some who like it better than others. For example, Skids already has a resources and resource intensive ability and he's spending resources on a lot so i don't think you want to include another card where you spend resources i think this is definitely a good jenny card because she's uh taking those treasure baths and rolling around in resources all the time that she usually has some extra to spare uh so jenny is a good look for that for sure um and, for and again it's for a single card is not not a small ask 
Yeah, it's definitely not. Um, but if you can afford it, it again, it's not something where you should use it throughout the whole game. It's more like having it there to make sure you can pass those very crucial tests. That's what I like it for more than anything. Yeah, it's an insurance policy. Yeah, and spending two resources to do that is pretty. And, you know, at, at, at even at this point in the game, we are a full cycle ahead of the cards we're reviewing. The accessory slot is not something that's very contentious. One of the interesting things you get into when you have Lucky Dice and Streetwise is do I spend those two re pump or do I hold them, <laughs> see what I get, and potentially redraw? Um, the redraw strategy is more... Um, risky because you could potentially just draw true two crap tokens, which has happened to all of us. And the streetwise strategy is more safe, but uh, you do have some options there. Or if you're Jenny and you're paying to win, you have both options. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> all right. The next one is yours, I believe. Opportunist level two course a level two rogue skill it has a one wild icon it's innate and developed commit only to a skill test that you are performing and if you buy two or more return opportunist to your hand after this <clears throat> okay. so we've talked about level zero opportunist on the AV before mm -hmm. it's uh concise to say that we didn't love it nope um, i don't think we we had not even any one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, and this gets us a little bit closer because instead of succeeding by three or more, you're down to two or more, which is definitely more surmountable. Still not in love with this card, though. Yeah. Three or more is just ridiculous. Like, there's nothing else that asks you to pass by three or more. The rogue standard is usually two or more. So this at least gets us there. But, um,. I don't know. I mean, the advantage what you're supposed to be doing here is just having a recurring wild icon, so almost like you're always plus one up. But it's it's pretty hard to succeed by two or three time unless you're just pumping everything. Um, that's the problem with it. The the, well, and the, the whole thing idea is you keep cycling you. it, right? It, the whole point yeah. is it comes back to your hand and you keep this. I succeed by a lot on, on tests that I want to succeed by a lot. I keep doing that. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem I have with that strategy is all it takes is one bad pull and all of a sudden this goes away. And if you're... Are there any card in the game that could pull this specific card back to your hand? I don't think there is. Like, it's done. Hope you yeah. got good use out of it. I'm not counting on it. Yeah, it's... There's just other rogue skills that are better, like quick thinking and hack and some future ones. It's hard to think of, yeah. Uh, the only thing I've thought about looking into the future is, again, Min, I feel like we're mentioning her a lot, but <laughs> she does change card calculations a ton when you're thinking about Icon. Maybe in multiplayer it'd be potentially interesting that this Min would turn this into a two wild. That's about the only thing I can think of. You mean the investigator who is shadowing Min like stink on a pig in order yes. to make this work? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's 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 two corner case even for me. That's yeah. I don't know. Not not a giant fan of what Opportunist is doing simply because it just it's the house of cards. Even if you get it working, it it's way too easy for the encounter deck to take it apart. Perhaps the only re redeeming quality of this are where Opportunist mm -hmm. this person like in the middle of their investigation stopping to get all the wine for <laughs> Yes. I mean, <laughs> fill it up. Why not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Might as well. All right. Um, looking into the future, part is mine. This is Alyssa Graham, four cost mystic asset, speaker to the dead is the subtitle with one intellect icon. Ally and sorcerer traded, you get plus one intellect. Free action, exhaust Alyssa Graham. Look at the top card of either the encounter deck or any player deck. You may then add one Doom to Alyssa Graham to place the Look That card on the bottom of its deck. She has one health and three sanity and takes up the ally 
uh, slot. I've seen it. I've seen it in this game, and I've also seen it in Lord of the Rings. The the word the looked at card. <laughs> Every time yeah. I read that, I'm like, ah, oh. like there's a, another way to put it. Like I get that it's just technical <laughs> hard rules language, but it just it still always reads. Yeah, it does. Uh, so Alyssa, how do you feel? I feel like a. Ella. Alyssa's great in the right investigator and garbage for everyone else. Mm. So, um, A, first of all, Purple just has a dearth of interesting allies. Purple has a dearth of allies in general. I feel like if there's any weakness in Mystic, it's that we just don't have a whole lot of allies who tend to be very, very powerful cards. Um, yeah. So... You know, in, in investigators that can take her, that, that plus one intellect is great, especially if you're planning on investigating in the normal way, in addition to the, the non-normal way that you tend to investigate with your right of seeking. Um, I do like her for just looking at the top card of the please, encounter please deck. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. Human, it is always good to see your kind. <laughs> I really wish I could understand why... I and where the Mass Effect sounds are coming from. I just got interrupted by an Elcor. <laughs> anyway. <Nice. laughs> um, so, 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 your, your Marie's like Alyssa because she can get a Doom on there and trigger Marie's ability. Um, she's got a nice Sanity Soak. She can, you know, if you're really scared about a weakness, she can look at your own deck. I don't mm -hmm. know how often that's going to be worth a Doom, but okay. Um, yeah, I I, th I think I just kind of fall back on what I first said. She's she's great in the right investigator, and I think in the wrong investigator, everyone else has better up. I think one of the best things she gives is uh just the passive intellect boost, which there are a couple other options out there. Like uh, Milan is the big one, uh, but you know intellect is such an important icon that sometimes mistakes and other low intellect characters don't have access to and this helps a lot giving another option there um but yeah i put it put her in kind of the top tier because the top tier of allies that is because i feel like the top tier allies just kind of fit into almost every deck that can take it um like you said i think it's more investigator specific i do think it's interesting thinking about Alyssa for those uh, investigators that have really bad weaknesses that need to avoid them. Um, I've experimented with, for example, with her and Lola, just maybe not even just avoid it. And again, I'm looking at the future, sorry. But <laughs> uh, the Lola investigator has a bad weakness, let's say that. And so I'll, I've used Alyssa to try to just see what's coming up and prepare for it. Uh, sometimes it's not even just avoiding it. Sometimes you just need to have your ducks in a row. Uh, so there's certain investigators that just have worse weaknesses than others, and this can help you stop it from happening. Or, because um, I mean, one doom to just put it off pretty much forever, unless you're going to cycle through your deck, is pretty good. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I wouldn't recommend her in any Agnes build, but I, I specifically built an Agnes to run through Carcosa, who was very clue-focused. And Alyssa was good in, in Agnes, not only for her intellect icon, of course, but because if you are able to scry Dark Memory off the top of an Agnes deck, you're saving yourself an action and two resources. If you draw Dark Memory, you're putting Doom on the agenda anyway. And and Alyssa can just bury that at the bottom and pretty decent trade. Yeah, it's uh, it's also a case of scenario specific. There's certain scenarios that they don't have those kind of killer treacheries or monsters that you need to avoid. So Alyssa, uh, less work there. But as Dunwich tech, like I've used Alyssa to keep an eye out for that beyond the veil and get rid of it if it shows up because uh, that's kind of a very defining card or in blood on the altar the the kidnap treachery which can be bad so yeah. if there are those certain cards that are just really terrible like this is a good option so of course always be aware that uh, you stand about a 90% chance to see the second copy of the card you just buried. <laughs> 
sure. Sure. All right. So, oh, I think this was uh, your turn. All right. Well, Right of Seeking level four is, of course, a mystic asset. It costs five resources. It has two intellect icons as the spell trait and uses three charges. Uses three charges. Um, action, spend one charge, investigate. You investigate using willpower instead of intellect. You get plus two willpower for this test. If successful, you discover two additional clues at this location. If a bad stuff token is revealed during this test, <laughs> after this test resolves, lose all remaining action immediately end your turn. As the spell, of course, takes up an arcane slot. Mm -hmm. So, level zero right of seeking, I think, is an auto include in any kind of well rounded mystic. Deck. That's pretty safe to say. Right. It's, it's it's spendy, but it's decent action compression, and it leverages generally a mystic's best skill. Right of seeking level four, though, I think you gotta really look at whether or not you're realistically ever going to be in a position where you can pull three clues off a single location. I think is the big thing. In solo, I don't think you ever spend four experience on this card because the number of locations in the game that are going to spawn three clues to actually have this be worth it, very, very small. Yeah. It's, I mean, the reason why you have to think about it so carefully is because it's so expensive in terms of XP. And then it's also more expensive than the base version, which is four, I believe it's five. Uh, I... I think, like you said, the base version is good for any well-rounded mystic, whereas the upgraded version, I think, goes into the territory of only for your kind of clover build mystics, where they're really dedicated to grabbing clues in multiplayer. Uh, I picked this one up. I was running a Roland and Jim campaign through Dunwich, where Roland was the fight i mean they were they were somewhat well balanced but roland was the fighter and i i was building jim to see how much of a clover he can build so i took this and it actually uh paid off well um in just allowing him to play that role of just gobbling up a whole location's clues in one action and yeah i think as as with level zero red of seeking the main thing with this one is you just got to watch when you initiate that action yeah Generally, last action is best practice. Uh, second to last, understandable. If you're doing this as first action, you better have a really good reason. Because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As mentioned, is actions it... are presh. So uh, yeah. losing them all is kind of a thing. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think it just fills in, fits into those specific uh, mystic investigative builds. And that's yep. about it. I mean, this is this is a baller card in four player because in four player, oh, yeah. pretty much any location that has clues is going to have at least three. Hell, I'll even say this is pretty decent. In three. The only time you really need to think about it is when you're two and down. Thinking about interesting uh, multiplayer plays, this would be an interesting double or nothing oh, combo. If your rogue throws down a double or nothing, you're getting plus two will, so potentially you're gobbling up. Uh, you're getting three clues, uh, six, six clues, clues, right? Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. That's a thing. <laughs> well. Oh, wait, I was about to say Safina players of the future, but Safina can't take this. Yeah. <laughs> Something to think about for your crazy play. I need to play more player. There's so many interesting comments. Really truly. Truly. I, that's why there. I don't play true solo anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's like you miss out on so many little interactions, but do each his own. Two player definitely does take long, or two handed definitely does take longer. So nice the argument. So now we move to a doozy of a card. <laughs> this is a big one. So this is Dark Horse, a survivor three cost asset with one uh, will icon. Condition traded, limit one per investigator. During the upkeep phase, you may choose to not gain resources. While you have no resources in your resource pool, you get plus one to all your skills. <clears throat> this so, is uh, this is a big one. 
I, I feel extra bad that Scott's not here today to, to help <laughs> us talk about Dark Horse, but the way it worked out. This is this is the type of card that you just build a deck. Yeah. I, I don't know if I can think of any other card in the game that begs you to build a deck around it more than Dark Horse. Yeah, there's not a ton of cards in the card pool so far that are th- similar in that way where they just beg you to build a deck around just that single card but dark horse is definitely one of them and uh it kind of blows your mind at first when you look at it you're gonna choose not to gain do it but uh it just running a dark horse deck just changes the whole way you think about resources in general which them so uh I think it's it bears mentioning that any Dunwich investigator can take, it, mm-hmm. which is pretty cray cray. Um, so where do you start with Dark Horse? We could do a whole, <laughs> I'm pretty sure we have done whole episodes on Dark Horse. Um, yeah. So the playing without resources though, is a thing. Mm-hmm. It demands a lot of your deck build. You have to go pretty lean. Uh, my Dark Horse builds tend to be pretty high on skill cards because. Basically, you just operate by the fact that, hey, I'm going to hit most of my skill tests. Yeah. Because Dark Horse is technically supposed to be taking the place of a lot of your assets that would be boosting you. And that would cost money. Yeah, and would cost money. And instead of spending on those, laying it all into Dark Horse. So yeah, you should should not be having a, a ton of expensive assets or events in your deck if you're first. Who do you and think? Kind of, oh, sorry, go ahead. And kind of the other key component of that is uh, part of your deck build is including cards that let you spend resources at will so you can uh, get down to no resources when you need to. Making your class specific permanent talent skill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unless you're Mystic. Because <laughs> it's always got to be weird. Um. Definitely more valuable because at the end of the day, you want to get down to no resources, especially because this is Fiverr. We're talking Fire Axe is, is in there too. That rewards yeah. you for having no. If you have, if you decide to get your resource because you're fighting this turn, you have Fire Axe and Dark Horse down. Fight, you spend your one resource off Fire Axe, and all of a sudden you're three up on the test. Well, maybe not on the test, but you're three up from where your base skill value is. It's pretty intense. Yeah. One of my yeah, favorite it... janky builds for this one is that Dark Horse Agnes build that we did on episode mm-hmm. Rimmer of Mythos yeah. Busters. Because um, Agnes already has her Forbidden Axe combo where she's using Forbidden Knowledge and Fire Axe to, to pull out some cool light tests. So you throw this on top of that and, oh man, it's my yeah, there's quite a few good. I think you were going to ask her about which investigator Dark Horse. There's quite a few builds mm-hmm. out there that are possible. Like, it's one of those cards that doesn't go on every deck, obviously, because you have to build your deck around it, but it can go in a lot of decks. Uh, the one I ran a lot was Windy Dark Horse through Dunwich. And it's a very different build than normal Windy, because normal Windy likes spending uh, for a lot of expensive events because of her. Uh, amulet and how she can recycle. Um, but Windy Dark Horse, you kind of are minimizing that a lot more. And then you're just coming at it from a mentality of like, no resources. Uh, I'm going to have high skills and then I'm going to rely on my Windy ability to get rid of the bad tokens. And I'm just going to pass a ton of uh, tests without having to put down a lot of stuff, have my agility to get out of trouble if I need it. Um, and use, you know, Fire Axe in that build. Fire Axe is, is mentioned kind of the the best buddy of Dark Horse <laughs> for the way it lets you fight and get rid of resources. So that was a, a fun and effective build. She made it all the way through Denwich and succeeded. So that's another one I like. Um, I think Ashcan the Dark Horse is another classic one. Mm-hmm. Or Duke Dark Horse, I should say. Yes. You should. <laughs> Because Ashcan can do a lot without playing many cards. 
Yeah. And I think that's that's ultimately the litmus test for whether your investigator is good for Dark Horse is can they operate without being able to or without having to play a bunch of cards in order to, to do it effectively. You're like I, I'm pretty sure I've even seen a Jenny Dark Horse build. That's pretty that's <laughs> yeah. pretty dumb. But you know, it works, I I guess. People have done it. But uh your ash cans, your uh, who else did you I've seen a Lola Dark Hells, Dark Horse build, you know, peeking ahead into the future. Lola's another really well-rounded investigator, so all of a sudden going to a four on all your stats, turns out that's kind of okay. Yeah. I, I think the thing with Dark Horse is it can also be... Like, you can have the Dark Horse build where your goal is to get it from turn one or yeah. turn two and just roll with it, but it can also be a type of thing where you get out some other stuff and then mid game you're looking to get out dark horse like i've got my stuff out now i can spend dark horse a first dark horse cuz i don't need anything else and just go with what i have plus dark horse um and kind of take it from that approach i think is also viable yep and i'll be the scott surrogate here cuz i know he's said this on the, the podcast proper but a lot of people think of Dark Horse as you need to build your deck around it. And I know Scott has mentioned that he kind of prefers to think of it as kind of a mid to late game finisher. Like you've built your board, mm. you're in the game, you're at that point where you're not really desperate to play a whole lot more by way of cards. So you can throw this down, spend your resources down, and then just kind of sit with your board and high stats. And it's a good way to close a game out and just, just really increase your probabilities of hitting hitting lots of tests yeah yeah like like you mentioned the only thing i'd I'd chalk up against dark horse is that it's not a permanent card and since it begs you to build your deck around it i have had so many freaking games where i've built a dark horse deck and dark horse just decides ain't gonna show up this game (laughs) yeah and that's a bummer but uh yeah maybe we'll get a level five that's a permanent card that does the same thing and it's also a card that asks a lot of you in terms of mm-hmm. uh, managing it and doing things in the right order, taking your tests in the right order, spending for things in the right order. So uh, definitely not like a card that I would recommend diving into right after you just built your first deck or something like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I play this game a lot and I am I fully admitted that I am not good enough to use Dark Horse to its full potential. This is a high skill cap card, 100%. For sure. All right. That brings us to our final card, uh, which I believe is mine, I think. Was it? Take it. Okay, I'm losing check. I'll take it. Um, Survival Instinct is a level two survivor skill with two agility icons, innate and developed traits. If this test is successful during an evasion attempt, the evading investigator may immediately evade each other enemy engaged with him or her and may move to a connecting location. Now, I need to refresh my memory of the original Survival Instinct, which has only one agility icon, I believe. Uh, I have to remember if the text is... That's correct, yeah. So, so you know, we're, we kind of got the series of the upgraded class-specific skills from the core set, and the, the other two that I think see... Or no, sorry, the other three that we see kind of stipulate that you get an extra bonus by succeeding by two or more. Don't think that's... I don't feel like the, the actual text has changed. In survival. So, so I just double-checked it, and so the big difference is the level zero version disengaged from each other enemy, ah. and this one evades each other. That... And the rest is the same. That's an important change, though. Yeah. Disengage only does you good if you're playing multiplayer, right? Because if you disengage solo, they're just going to re-engage with you. Yeah. Oh, wait, but you move to a connecting location. That's the key part. So you but if just, they have... You, yeah, they you have hunter, hunter, hunter then... for a turn with the new one. Yeah. The big benefit. Um... Okay, so, Ian. You're probably the person I know uh, personally who, who talks the most about Wendy and I have to say anything about Wendy <laughs> is that she's the investigator who probably is going to be the sneakiest, skirtiest, survival mm-hmm. instinctiest type investigator in the game. 
How often do these cards make it into that deck? I have to say I haven't used it a ton. Um, but I think that might be a fault on my part than the card because I do see some value in it. Uh, part of the reason is because with level two, I feel like I end up spending my XP on other stuff, even though Survivor doesn't ask a ton of you in terms of spending experience. But but still, it's a thing that you have to pay for paying uh, for this uh, skill card when I might be buying something like Stroke of Luck, uh, which I can't remember when exactly that's released. So I can't remember if that's future. Probably. Um, no, that's, that's the Carcosa card. Okay. Um, so, so it doesn't make it into my decks a ton, but the, the thing I like about it <laughs> is actually not even so much the change to the text, but the fact you get the two uh, agility versus one. So whenever I see that, then I start thinking, okay, then that could potentially be a replacement for manual dexterity in my deck if I'm running manual dexterity, which I might be in a very evade deck that, okay, this could slot. I lose the card draw, but I'm getting um, I'm getting the the extra stuff here, which is sometimes it's not even because I think it's easy to look at this card and just think crowd evade card but sometimes it's just the fact that it gives you an extra move so it's almost an extra action and it rolls the evade and move card yeah and i again i don't play true solo very often but when i have and i've been playing an investigator that's not particularly good at fighting generally you have some kind of other enemy mitigation in your deck a lot of times that ends up taking the form of evasion tactics. Hmm? There are times where I end up evading an enemy, I get stuck, I have to investigate that location, and I just have to eat the fact that the enemy's going to re-engage me at the end of the turn, and then I pull another enemy off the encounter deck. <laughs> yeah. Those, those kind of situations do present themselves, I think, with enough regularity in True Solo that I... Well, the next time I play true solo and inv an investigator I'm playing can take this card. I might look at it. Yeah, I think I'm trying to think of stories. I do have, I can remember fact because you get, you run into those kind of action situ uh limitation situations where it's like, oh, I have enough to evade, but I can't move the car and I really need to. Um, so it can come in handy there. I think one of the reasons I di didn't use it in some of my windy is I was running Cat Burglar, which does something similar. Um, so yeah, it's definitely not a, every investigation. It's it's worth a look because, like as I said, with those two agility icons, you're thinking about including a two agility icon of some kind. You should think about this card, the survival instinct, for, uh, the action compression alone, and. On a flyer and three or four player, if you're trying to run the the windy dodge tank model and just suck up all the enemies, and, that that would be possible. With this. Sorry, we had another surprise Mass Effect sound. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, Edie. Uh, yeah. God, you know, of all the cards in this pack, this is the one that I'm looking at and going, man, why don't I look at this card more often? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same. It's one I often think about, but uh, haven't used the ten. Hmm. Hmm. So, where would you put this pack as a whole, as far as where the cards fall? You know, we we just got done with the uh, the blood on the altar pack, which was very solidly positive. This one has some high highs and some low lows. Yeah, but I, I feel like we're kind of middling on on this pack. There there are some good cards in specific situations. Dark Horse is a meta-defining card for, for its faction. Good. Firing mod. Yeah. yeah I'm but then at a we solid get, middle. We, then we get cards like the Spiel, um, Spring. Opportunist. Opportunist. And then there are some cards that Expose are just kind of... Expose weakness. Yeah, and expose weakness, and then we get a couple that are more situational. So, yeah, this is kind of the textbook definition of a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. 
No, I sure. I will. I know I've said it on our podcast. I'll say it again. What I love about this game is is Matt could look at feedback like this, like that has been given on cards, be like, okay, to increase the level by one or two, fix the mechanic, have another go at it, and all of a sudden that card becomes super playable. We saw yeah. it. Might see it with Aquina. I can, I don't think we've gotten to a leveled up Aquina yet, but we'll get there. Oh. I don't think so. That's one thing I, I love about the design space of this game is that none of these cards in a future incarnation is like the the future's just anything they want it to be. It's not set. No fate for what fate we make for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that line is. Yep. That so that sounds right. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> I think we could do our usual plugs, which is make sure you check out the other videos in our Miskatonic AV Club series. If you stumbled upon this, fell through a random pool and ended up here and not sure what you're listening to and where you are, uh, we also run a uh, actual podcast, the Mythos Busters podcast, that you should find on iTunes and other places uh, and subscribe to that where we you know just come out with episodes on all kinds of topics you can find our facebook page give us a like uh what else did i miss anything important oh i missed this on the last one too we have a mythos busters hotline oh yes and normally we plug this on the regular podcast but it's super applicable to to twitch and youtube as well if you have a question comment you want to give us feedback um, on anything we're doing on our Twitch channel, on the AV Club, on the podcast proper, whatever it happens to be, give us a call. It's 203-493-MYTH. That's 203-493-6984. And, uh, you know, if we start getting some uh, AV Club-specific messages, you know, we might look at doing some, some one-off discussion topics and, and kind of maybe branch off from our card reviews, once we get caught up, of course. Um, and then, of course, uh, anything you submit might be played on the podcast itself if it's a question that we can address and kind of make a discussion out of. Yep. So give us a call. Um, it will go Please to voicemail where you're not going to interrupt. Yeah, man, it is always good to see so. your kind. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Unexpected Elcor. Yeah. <laughs> nice. My favorite kind of Elcor. <laughs> um, so I think that's about it. Thanks for. And we'll see you next time on the Tonic AV.